Welcome back, lecture eight today. We are uh, a little abbreviated in numbers today. Actually, I'm kind of surprised that um, all of you made it. Um, we have had some snow, for those of you that uh, are not kind of right up with us at the moment, some snow and ice, and um, made classes canceled yesterday, and classes were canceled, I know you were sorry to see that, canceled until 10, right? And this one starts at 10.15. Um, but most of us are here. Uh, we will have to make some slight adjustments to the syllabus, possibly. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but the tests will take place on the day when they've been scheduled. If we do adjust anything, it'll be the content that's included by that test, but I'm not going to change the test days unless we happen to be out on the test days, and then obviously we'd have to change them. But um, we kind of have a little built-in cushion. There are some um, problem-solving, they call them focus on problem-solving sections, that it's built into the syllabus if time permits, so maybe time won't permit, but we can kind of get back on the schedule that way. So the goal today is to start into Chapter 6, and um, we will see what happens. These are different applications of integration, so we've learned a lot of techniques of how to integrate. We kind of know one application, and that is that it is area under a curve, uh, and now we're going to learn some other applications of integration. John is all excited because his Pittsburgh Steelers won, and they're in the Super Bowl. And I actually have an outside chance of going to the Super Bowl, so I'm kind of waiting on a couple phone calls, so that could be exciting. And no, you're not going to get my ticket if I get one. Okay, 6.1 talks about uh, area between two curves. So that seems like it's pretty simplistic. Uh, step forward from the area under a curve, but from time to time, depending on how the curves are shaped in the plane, or if they're parametric in nature, it, uh, it can get a little more complicated than just simply area under a curve. So there might be more lines or curves, but basically we'll take them two at a time, kind of which one is the upward, upward part of that a region that's bounded and which one is the lower part of the region that's bounded. So let's say we have some f of x up here and some g of x, I'm going to start them without their intersection at all, so we'll have to decide where to start the process and where to end this area gathering process. So there's the region that we want to know its area. There are two very good ways of remembering this. Let's briefly go through both of them and then you can kind of choose which one you hang on to to remember how to find the area between two curves. You could look at this kind of as two pictures. The area under the f of x all the way down to the x-axis. We know how to do that. That'll give us what we want there, right? And then obviously that's too much. We want to throw out the region that we don't want that's part of that. So if you think about the area under the g of x curve, isn't that exactly the region we want to throw out? So we want to take this this region and basically come back up here and get rid of it. So we want to subtract out the area under the g of x, and that'll leave us exactly what we want right here in this shaded region. So that's one way to remember it. It's the area under the upper 
curve, y equals f of x. Subtract from it the area under the lower curve, y equals g of x, and we can put those together. Because the limits are the same, and we're integrating with respect to x, so from a to b, f of x minus g of x. So that'll get us the area between two curves. It doesn't really matter where they are, but it does matter that we can kind of establish um, the region without any overlap, and I'll try to get a diagram that does have overlap in a minute. But we want to be able to basically define the upper curve, the f of x curve, and that's defined separately and differently from the lower curve of this region, which is the g of x. So it's y value on the upper curve minus y value on the lower curve. Now, another way of coming up with that same thing is to think of this in terms of skinny little rectangles, like we did initially with area. And we would say, how tall is this rectangle? Well, when it was just one curve, it was f of x tall. Now we've got two curves, so we need to know this distance from here to here. What would you call that distance? From this curve up here to this curve down here. Okay, isn't that f of x minus g of x? Isn't that the height of that rectangle? And the width is still our old friend delta x, so you could define it in terms of height times width. The height is f of x minus g of x. That's how tall it is. And the width is delta x, and you come up with the same formula. So this actually, this developing a, a, a piece of it, like we did with the skinny little rectangles, that's actually helpful in the whole process as we go through chapter 6. So, but either way, that helps you remember this formula to take the y value on the upper curve, subtract from it the y value on the lower curve. You're either going to be given a starting and stopping point, or it's going to be your job to find them. So what do I mean by it's going to be your job to find them? So let's say we have a parabola that opens down and a parabola that opens up, and they actually have a bounded region. So we want to know where to start this process and where to end this process. So let's say the parabola opening down is f of x. The parabola opening up is g of x. How could you find the starting and stopping points for this bounded region? where they intersect, and how could you find where they intersect? Equal. Say them equal to each other. So when you want to find this value and this value, set them equal to each other and solve. And that should give you some initial x value and then some x value a little bit later down the road. So if you're not given them, you can set them equal to each other and solve for them. Now, here's what I was talking about. You want to make sure that your regions, in this case your skinny little rectangles, all have the top on the upper curve and the bottom on the lower curve, and that that never changes as we go from this x value to this x value. I think that is the case here, right? The top of each one is on the parabola that opens down and the bottom of each one is on the parabola that opens up. And if that switches, then we need to interchange what constitutes the upper y value and the lower y value. So if we were setting this up from the points of intersection that we get right here, x1 to x2, whatever they are, we don't know the function, so we can't say what they are, the y value on the upper curve is f of x, the y value on the lower curve. The lower curve is, in fact, the g of x. And then we would do any subtraction that we could before we integrate, integrate, and evaluate. 
All right, let's take a look at an example like this. In fact, let's look at um, one very similar to that. And I'm not going to call them f of x and g of x. We can decide which is the upper and which is the lower. A couple of the examples we're going to do today are in the book because they're kind of, uh, we've either done something with them before, like the cycloid, when we get to parametric equations, um, or they're just kind of good introductory problems. I don't think this one is in the book, but it's, I don't know, my, is it? Anyway, you've got a variety, I think, of ones in the book and ones that will not be in the book that you can refer back to. Uh, tell me what we have here with these two curves. What's the first one? Parabola. Parabola that opens down. Parabola that opens down, right? Because of the negative coefficient of the x squared. What about the next one? Parabola that opens up. Opens up. Uh, probably somewhat similar to what I just sketched on the previous diagram. Uh, without a graphing calculator, let's kind of quickly come up with uh, a sketch of 4x minus x squared. What can we do to get a rough sketch? All we want to do is see which curve is above the other one. We prob I mean, it's probably going to be the parabola that opens down, right? It's going to be the upper curve and the parabola that opens up will be the other one. But let's get a quick sketch of this. The top is at x equals 2. Okay, how did you know that? The derivative. Just okay, good. Zero. I mean, we know some calculus, right? We might as well use it. So the derivative would be what? 4 minus 2x. 4 minus 2x. 4 minus 2x, and we want to know the vertex, so we want to know where the derivative is 0, and that happens at x equals 2, so we could actually plot that point. Or you could remember from a pre-calculus course that the vertex is what? Negative b over... 2a, you remember that? No? But we have a better way. We can use calculus to get it. So we would put that into the function and see what it kicks out. Uh, if you're plotting points, the nice thing about this equation, you can kind of put together some of these, use some of these, not use some of these. But this factors real nicely. x factors out, right? And we want to know where y is 0, well, that's at x equals 0, right? And x equals 4. Now, doesn't that also then add fuel to the fire that the vertex is at 2, right? If we're here at 0, 0, and 4, 0, the vertex better be at 2 something because we've got to have that natural symmetry. And 2, what is the top function evaluated at x equals 2? 4? So there's our parabola that opens down. Um, how about the next one? Does that factor? x squared minus 6x plus 8. Minus 4, minus 2. I think that's right. And when x is, what, 2 and 4? Mm -hmm. y is 0. So 2, something, and 4, something. Actually, 2, 0, right? And 4, 0. Are the points? And where's the vertex? It goes through the point two zero and four zero. Three, Three something. And what is the yeah. put three in there, what do we get? Nine. Oh wait, yeah. Plus eight. Yes. Seventeen minus 18, negative 1, 
Does that sound right? Now, one point I do know, because we actually plotted that point on both functions, is x equals 4. So I know that's the upper limit of integration. The lower limit might be 1, but I'm not necessarily going to trust my graph here, that it is 1, maybe 1, might be 1.1. Uh, what can we do to make sure we have the exact point of intersection? Set them equal. <laughs> So we can add x squared to both sides. That's gone. We've got 2x squared. Uh, we can subtract 4x from both sides. That's gone. So we have 0 over here. Minus 10x plus 8. And then factor, I think it factors. Minus 4, minus 1. Minus 4, minus 1. So it looks like 4, which we already knew 4 was one of the points. We plotted that on both curves. And it is 1. Uh, looks like 1, but I don't, I'm not going to trust my graph. But now I've got a little more validation other than my picture. So we want the area of this region from 1 to 4. All right, so we know the limits, 1 to 4. We're going to integrate with respect to x, what minus what? What's 4x minus x squared, that's the y value on the upper curve minus y value on the lower curve integrated with respect to x. Questions or issues about that one? So let's go ahead and do the addition and subtraction. We've got uh, minus x squared minus another x squared minus two of those. We've got 4x minus a negative 6x. And then we've got a what? Minus 8? You don't have to do the subtraction before you integrate, but it'll save a little bit of work. So now we integrate. Integral of negative 2x squared integrated with respect to x. Negative two thirds x cubed, integral of ten x with respect to x. Five x squared or ten x squared over two. And the integral of negative eight. Negative the evaluation is from one to four. Let's at least set up the arithmetic. So if we put in four. that. If we put in 1, we get that. Any question about what to do from that point? Punch the appropriate buttons on your calculator, right, from that point. Questions on that one? Let's see if I have that written down, the answer. I do not have that written down. Sorry. Let's suppose that we have a region that is, uh, let's say, a parabola, but it's type of parabola that's not a function. So let's say we have a parabola that opens to the right, and I don't know, some other curve. 
keep it simple. Let's say it's a line. Do you see the problem with the same type of mentality is if we split this up into a bunch of skinny little rectangles, we use the same thought process. What's the problem with those two skinny little rectangles? Okay, they are the y value up here and the y value down here are on the same curve, right? So it's not like y value on the upper curve minus y value on the lower curve. They're on the same curve. Same thing here. Now, eventually, when we get past this point, our rectangles are good, right? Y value on the upper curve, y value on the lower curve, and those, the rest of the way, those are going to be good. But this part of the region, it's a problem. How can we solve that problem? Okay, let's go rectangles the other way. So how about rectangles that are formed in this fashion? As long as we describe them properly, we have their height described properly, we describe their width properly, if we describe one of them and basically say where they start and where they end, then we ought to be in the same exact situation. Now, as you look at all of these rectangles, and we try to determine their height, wouldn't their height be the x value over here minus the x value over here? Is that correct? Is that true about all of them? Every, well, those that are pictured and any others that you can visualize, the height of this one is x value here minus x value here? All of them the same? So we want x value of the curve on the right minus x value of the curve on the left. What's the width or thickness of each one? What would you say that is? Delta x? That's a delta y, isn't it? Some increment of y, thickness of some delta y. When we draw them this way, we've got delta x's, right? From this x value to the next x value, we're crawling along little delta x's along the way. Now we're going to crawl up, so to speak, little delta y's along the way. So as long as we can describe them in the same fashion, all of them, which we can, x value curve on the right minus x value curve on the left, we would start this at some initial y value, and we would end this process at some y value, a little bit larger than that. So we kind of just reorient the whole process. Instead of going from x0 to x1, we go from y0 to y1. We're integrating with respect to y. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? We're going to have a dy in there. So we want x value. I'll just put a little subscripted curve on the right, minus x value curve on the left, we want a delta y or dy from our initial y value to our final y value. Same process, just change how we're constructing those rectangles. And you'll, you'll know there's a problem because you'll try to do it the other way, which we can most of the time, but the y value up here and the y value down here we're on the same curve, so it's got to be a problem. Let's see if we can reorient the rectangles and, and have success the other direction. Uh, let's see where my example is. Now, I've always wanted to do my part in here. Just keep that in mind as we go through problems. So I'll graph the second one. Uh, x equals y squared. Better button up my shirt. My heart's going to fall out, right? Um, and then you guys can tell me how to graph the other one. So isn't that our old friend y equals x squared? Just kind of shift it over and opening to the right. How are we going to graph this?
we could actually solve it for y. Where does this start? It is a non-function type of parabola, just like this one is. It's linear in terms of x, quadratic in terms of y, just like this one. Linear in terms of x, quadratic in terms of y. x plus 4, what kind of effect does that have? Shifts it how many units in which direction? <coughs> Four left, four units. Is that correct? Don't worry about the square root. Just worry about what's added to or subtracted from x. So we're going to shift left four units. Now, if you put negative four in there, let's just check it. If you put negative four in for x, you get zero over here. So that means y has to be zero, right? So it's got to be the vertex. Um, I don't know. Is it open right or left? Right. right. It opens to the right. Is it a little fatter than our old friend right here or a little skinnier? Maybe that's a bad question <coughs> for a day after a snow holiday. Let's, where does it hit the axis? Square root of 2. Square root of 2? So if x is 0, this is 4. Divide both sides by 2, right? y squared equals 2, square root of 2. So there's 1, there's 2, square root of 2 is about what? 1.4. 1 Whoops. So there's our region. Region bounded between two functions, neither one of which is a two curves, neither one of which is a function. So can I draw my rectangles this way? Not, not going to work. So I'm going to have to construct my rectangles left to right. So there's one of them, there's one of them. Let's describe the height of one of those rectangles. The height would be x value of the curve on the right. What's the x value of the curve on the right? Which curve is on the right? This one? This one's the one on the right. This one's the one on the left. So what's the x value of the curve on the right? Y squared? What's the x value of the curve on the left? Good. 2y squared minus 4. In other words, solve it for x. What is x equal to on this one? This one's already solved for x, so we didn't have to do any work. Just write it down. So that should be x value, curve on the right. Check it out. This should be x value, curve on the left. We want to integrate. Each one has thickness delta y or dy. And we want to integrate from some y value down here, whatever this y value is right here, I don't know. And whatever this y value is up here, I don't know. Kind of looks like 2, but again, I'm not going to trust my graph. How do I find out the limits of integration? Set them equal. So 2y squared equals x plus 4 if we solve that for x x equals 2y squared minus 4. The other one is already solved for x. So if we solve them both for x and then set those end results equal to each other, 2y squared minus 4 equals y squared. It's going to be plus or minus 2, isn't it? Subtract y squared from each side. So 2y squared minus y squared is, oh, that's just 2, isn't it? The y squareds are gone? No. That would be 2y squared minus 1 of the y squareds is what? 1 of the y squareds remain. Sorry, I shouldn't 
say that stuff out loud, but I've been told that for so many years that kind of on some level I, I want to say it, but it, I know it's not true. So y equals plus or minus 2. So it looks like we're going to go from negative 2 to 2. So this intersection point right here in terms of y is negative 2, and this intersection point right here in terms of y is positive 2. So there's our work. Let's take that to another page and at least get it to the point where we've got integrated and evaluated and then not necessarily doing the arithmetic, but we can if it looks pretty simple. So we have y squared minus 2y squared, which would be negative y squared. And we have minus a negative 4, which would be plus 4. Does that look right? Let's integrate. Negative y squared would be negative y cubed over 3. Integral of 4 with respect to y would be 4y. So negative of 2 cubed over 3 plus 4 twos. negative of negative 2 cubed over 3 plus 4 negative 2's. Let's go ahead and do the arithmetic on this one. So we have what? Negative 8 thirds plus 8. When we cube a negative, we get a negative, we're going to subtract it, which is positive, and then we're going to subtract that again, which is back to negative, right? So negative 8 thirds that's going to be negative 8, which we're going to subtract and get 8. So 16 minus 16 thirds. 16 is 48 thirds minus 16 thirds. 32 thirds, or 10 and 2 thirds square units, right? Of area bounded between these two curves. Hopefully that arithmetic went well. So after you get a, a rough sketch of the regions, see which orientation, as far as the rectangles are concerned, is going to give you um, the correct area. As long as you're not bounded on the top and the bottom by the same curve, or left and right by the same curve. Okay, let's at least set this one up. There is a reason for looking at a problem like this, which we'll get to when we get a picture. We have a cubic polynomial. Um, we're not expected to factor this cubic polynomial, but we want to get an idea of where it is in the plane. I think it's going to be helpful if we do that. Again, I could do my part and graph the second one, okay, if you guys can graph the first one. Uh, let's use derivatives to get a sketch of the first curve. So the derivative is 3x squared plus 6x minus 9. Why do we want the derivative? What purpose is that going to serve to sketch this curve? Uh, show you where it equals zero. Okay, like at the flat places where it kind of reaches a relative max, where it has a relative min. It's probably going to look something like this, um, something like that, right? This cubic polynomial. So we can factor out a 3. And then we'll set the derivative equal to 0 to find those places where the curve itself is flat. And that appears to be what? I think this factors. Minus 3 plus 1. Does that work? I think that works. 
So what x values cause the derivative to be zero? Not right, Ben? It's plus two. Oh, there we go. Okay. That's plus. Thank you. And that's still minus, right? So that makes it plus three minus one. Thank you. So x is negative three and one. And we need to find those points, so we'll put them back into the equation. Negative three something and one something. What do we get when we put one in there? We get one plus three minus nine minus 12. What do we get? Negative 21 plus four, negative 17. Does that look right? Negative three. So we've got negative three cubed. Three times negative three squared minus nine times negative three minus 12. So there's negative 27 plus 27. So those knock each other out. Is that right? And positive 27 minus 12, 15. How's that look? All right, so let's get a sketch of this one. Sketch the line, and then we'll see how this problem is different from the other two that we've looked at. So negative 3, 15, it's flat there, and positive 1, negative 17, it's flat there. So we could do the increasing and decreasing stuff. I, I don't think there's any doubt that in order to get from this point down to this point, you have to leave here fairly flat and enter here fairly flat. I think if we either use the derivative to see where it's increasing and decreasing, I think we'll see that this curve increases into here and increases out of here. So that's not unlike what we thought it was going to look like. So we graph the other one. The other one is y equals 4x plus 3. So we've got a y-intercept of 3 and a slope of 4. So there's a region that's bounded and there's another region that's bounded. Why is this problem, based on this sketch, different from the other two examples that we've looked at? The function that's on top changes. The function that's on top changes. It changes at this point right here, whatever that is. We could set them equal to each other. That's not the issue. The issue is deciding that these rectangles, although within this region, we're good with these kind of rectangles, right? The upper curve is the cubic polynomial. The lower curve is the line. Then we change at this point. The upper curve changes to the line. The lower curve is the polynomial. So it looks like kind of two separate problems. So the first region from this point Let's call it x0 to this point where they meet, x1. So from x0 to x1, it is the polynomial. Minus, that's the y value on the upper curve. Y value on the lower curve is 4x plus 3. Everybody content with that? That takes care of our first shaded region. When we get past x1, or right at x1, all the way out to here, whatever that is, x2, now the upper curve, or the y value on the upper curve, is 4x plus 3. y value on the lower curve is 
So sometimes if the curves intersect and then the other one takes the upper curve roll and they switch, the other one has the lower curve roll, we do need to break it up. Now, this is probably something you're not expected to do, is to identify x0, x1, and x2, but if we were going to go about that business, what would we do? Set them equal to each other? Now, here's probably why this is not a fair problem from this point, because you would be setting x cubed plus 3x squared minus 9x minus 12 equal to 4x plus 3. So eventually you'd have a cubic polynomial and it'd be your responsibility to factor it and that's, I'm not holding you to that level of responsibility. So that would be x cubed, what, plus 3x squared? Minus 13x. Minus 15. Now, if everything had a factor of x, we could factor an x out, and then we have a quadratic. That's fair. But factoring this and finding x0, x1, and x2, that's not the purpose of this problem anyway. I just wanted to show that we had a way to graph the cubic using some previous calculus and then we switch the upper curve and the lower curve. So we just basically stop and start our integral that solves the problem. All right, I don't know that we can finish this next one, but let's see if we can at least get it set up. Um, area under a curve. If we just have simple area under a curve, we would have f of x dx from a to b. We've done that numerous times. Uh, that's kind of even taking a step back from what we've done in this class today. If it's helpful to think of the area under the curve f of x dx as y dx, that's kind of what we're doing. Now let's adapt this to a parametric version. Let's say we have y equals uh, x equals some function of t. We'll get an example in a minute. And y equals some other function of t. So we have this parameter introduced into the problem that we don't have x in terms of y or y in terms of x. We've got each one defined in terms of t. Maybe t is time. So we've got parametric equations. Well, y, we've got y right here. We want to kind of imitate this same process. y is really g of t. dx, well, we've got x. All we have to do is take the derivative of x. And if we integrate that with respect to t, from our initial t value to our next t value that's either given to us or that we find ourselves, then we can imitate the same thing from area under a curve to area under a parametric curve. So I don't think we've had that yet. Right? I don't think we've had to contend with parametric equations and finding the area under a curve. So I think we can get this set up, but that's probably about all we'll do. Uh, earlier in this class, we had a cycloid, and we had the equation of a cycloid. Let me try to quickly refresh your memory what this cycloid was. We started here with a circle, and there was a dot on that circle. And then we rolled that can or that circle along the x-axis. So as we rolled it along, the path of that dot on the circle was something like that. Remember we did that earlier in this class? Have we, have we not done that? Maybe we did that in 141. We did that in 141. I got a okay look from a couple of you, but not from all of you. But uh, 
if this is not something you did in your 141 class, um, take a look back at the first reference in this book for a cycloid. But if you'll have a, I wish I'd brought something now, uh, anything that's circular in shape, you take the end of a cylinder, put a dot on it, and roll that cylinder along the desk, so along the x-axis, the path of that dot as you roll it along follows something like this. So eventually you've got this, as you roll that along it ends up here, that's its highest point, and as you continue to roll it along the desktop or the x-axis, that dot ends up back here. So this is the path of the dot, and this curve is called a cycloid, and the equations of a cycloid, parametric equations, are as follows whatever the radius is of this circle that's generating the cycloid is R. That's the X description in terms of R and theta. And the Y description is this. So we have X in terms of theta and Y in terms of theta. If we picked a particular value of theta, which we could do, and we're not going to do a lot of this, but So let's say we picked 0. If 0 is the theta value, that means that we haven't started this process yet. And by the way, what 0 is where we're going to start. What is the angle that we've gone through by the time we get this thing all rolled over there and it's right back where it started? Two pi. That's 2 pi. <clears throat> so 0, let's see, what would we be? 0 minus the sine of 0, that's 0, right? 0 times r is 0. 1 minus the cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So that's r times 0. So we're starting at 0, 0. We knew that. That validates that point. Um, let's go at the halfway point here. If theta is pi, we've got pi minus the sine of pi. What's the sine of pi? Zero. zero. So that's pi minus zero, which is pi. So r, whatever r is, so we come over theta, excuse me, we come over pi and we go up r. Is that right? So r is not really the radius, isn't it the diameter? Is that right? We come over and plot this point, it's over pi and up. Wait a minute. So we've got we've got pi minus zero, which is pi, and pi times r. There we go. Is that right? That's what we're plotting. So that's our x value, and our y value. If we put in pi, cosine of pi is negative 1, so 1 minus negative 1 is 2. two. Let's make it simple. Let's make r equal to 1. So if r is equal to 1, this point, the x value is pi, right? Pi times 1, to simplify it a little bit. And the y value, if r is 1, this would be 2. two. And if r is 1, this would be 1, and this would be 1, so we would go up r and then another r, right? So we're going to go up 2r. So we go over pi times r. Let's say that r is 1. Go over pi and up 2, and we're at this point. And you could continue to do points. So let's set this up, and then we're out of time. So we want to set this up so that we have the y value, and then derivative of the x value. And then we'll pick up from this point tomorrow. Our limits are what? 0 to 2 pi? What's the y value? R, 1 minus cosine theta. 
and what's the derivative of the x value. Derivative of theta with respect to theta is 1. Derivative of sine of theta with respect to theta is cosine theta. Something's not right here. Yeah, yeah, we're okay. I was thinking that we needed. So here's our y. Here's our dx. We will pick up from this point because we're out of time today.